So to do this, ZFS has a bunch of different options for understanding your RAID, for basically doing software RAID. So you have your traditional mirroring, where you can do you know, single disk, double, you know, two di mirror across two disks, three disks, you know, as many as you kind of want to get. Then we have something called RAID Z. So RAID Z is similar to RAID 5 in most traditional aspects, but it's done a little bit differently, so it's to plug the read modify write bulb. So as opposed to having a fixed width stripe, ZFS is actually going to change the stripe size that it's writing out depending on what you actually, how much you need to do. And so similar to RAID 5, we have RAID 6, which supports double parity. And then we also have something that's basically you could call RAID 7, which basically supports triple parity. So you can lose any three disks in the array. And this was basically done because of the fact that you have increasingly large disks, the act of resilvering or kind of restoring the data is taking longer and longer. And so the likelihood that you might have another disk failure then if you just kind of look at it statistically and what the mean time between failures is, slowly and continually increases such that perhaps that risk is actually not worth it. So the other part of ZFS is basically to make sure that your data itself actually is protected and you actually have interesting things you can do with it. So there's 128-bit checksums on all every block on the file system everywhere. So data is checksumed and when you basically kind of is, uh, sorry, as you read from the disk, ZFS is going to actually check that checksum. It's going to actually verify that that checksum matches. And if it doesn't match, ZFS is either going to return an error up to the user application, or if you're mirroring or you're doing another kind of RAID, ZFS will go and just read from the other device. So through this, ZFS will basically preemptively go ahead and repair it. And if it can't repair it, it's going to unfortunately just have this go up and notify the user that, unfortunately, the data is corrupted. And this silent bit corruption does actually happen. And as you're basically writing down data through the different transports and kind of just through different devices, sometimes bits end up flipping. That's just an unfortunate nature of both the elect electrical characteristics of it and just the fact that radiation actually can flip bits. So another part of the data integrity is that ZFS was one of the first file systems perhaps the first, to make sure that it always sends SCSI cache flush commands. So what this means is that a disk is actually lies to us. When we write data to the disk, it's actually not on the disk's platter. The disk actually has a bunch of DRAM that it basically keeps data in so it can respond to you really quickly. So it'll accept a write into that DRAM, and then it will kind of, at its own leisure, write it out to the platter. So if you actually don't send these explicit cache flush commands, then you actually could have the case where you thought you wrote data to the disk, and the disk actually has it in its cache and not on the platter. So having that there is basically a way of making sure that your data is always safe. So a ZFS can't crash, think it's in one state, and have the on-disk state be corrupt. In addition, you basically get the kind of standard bevy of enterprise features that people kind of want to have and usually have to pay a lot extra for, or add some other layer in between kind of built into the file system. So you can just add in compression on a per data set basis, which basically lets you select whether you want to use a LZO based compression algorithm or GZIP one through nine, kind of whatever you'd like. Um, there is deduplication support. Dedupe is not the panacea and necess everyone necessarily thinks it is, so just use it with caution. <laughs> a lot of caution. <laughs> um, the other big things about ZFS are basically how we help and kind of use DRAM to our advantage and how we can leverage SSDs. So, we developed something called the Adaptive Replacement Cache, which is basically a caching strategy that's going to use as much DRAM as possible. And when the system requires more DRAM, it's basically going to kick it out of the ARC, and the ARC will give back DRAM to the system. So oftentimes, you're going to have these boxes that you have sitting around. These days, boxes are getting more and more DRAM, and you actually don't end up using most of it. People kind of like to say, look, I'm not using my DRAM, and that's a good thing. And so the extra DRAM will be used for caching. So this means that if you have something that you've read recently, you're basically going to be able to service it quickly from the ARC. So with this, we can get response times, especially for random reads, that go a lot quicker because they haven't, the data actually hasn't changed. So you don't have to go back to disk every time. However, DRAM is ultimately not that big. And DRAM also takes up a lot of power. You also have the problem that people want to use the power of SSDs, but the price point on SSDs hasn't quite made it to be the best yet. So the Gigabytes per dollar you're getting on SSDs doesn't match traditional spinning media. And so what you want to do instead is you want to create basically a hybrid 
notion of a hybrid sword tool. This work was originally done by Brendan Gregg, who did the presentation. This has been around since the Fishworks project launched in 2008 and in open solar since then. So it's been seen a lot of use. And so what you do instead is that you basically use SSDs to either act as a, to act as a read cache or to basically be a sync for synchronous writes. So a lot of people run databases. And a database is basically always going to need to do a synchronous write to make sure a transaction is set on disk. Now you're going to basically, this gets queued up traditionally. You're going to wait for it to go, wait for the rotations, wait for it to actually be written out on disk. This usually takes you know, maybe 8 to 20 milliseconds if you're lucky. And the application is actually blocked during that entire time. So to get around this, you can get a small SSD. You don't need more than maybe a gigabyte of data in your Zill. And you basically will write it out to this intent log. So once it's on the SSD, it's now on stable storage, so you can act back the write. So the last little bit of ZFS that's important here are snapshots and clones. So because we have a copy on write file system, you can take these snapshots of the file system. So a snapshot basically takes a read-only copy and basically is a point in time of your data. So you are doing some series of writes, you can take a snapshot. And then you can do more writes, take another snapshot. But what you can also do is you can use that snapshot as a starting point for a new data set. So you can say, I want to actually clone this snapshot. When you take the clone, you're actually going to share all of the data blocks that you in the new clone. And then once you start writing and modifying the content that previously existed, that's the only time that you're going to make a copy of it. So for certain cases, for example, people are doing this with databases, you're going to have someone take a snapshot of the database at a certain point in time, make a clone so you can quickly spin up a temporary copy of it, and then tear it down again. The last little bit about here that's interesting is that ZFS has something basically called ZFS send and ZFS receive. This lets you actually take a snapshot, send it over to another host, and basically import that entire set of data. So the most common way people do this is something like ZFS send, pipe to SSH, and ZFS receive. Or you can, of course, just send this directly to a file. But the benefit here is that you can actually send incrementals between snapshots. So traditionally, you know, if you're using rsync or another tool, you're going to say, okay, great, I appended a little bit to this, log, to this large file. So this gigabyte file has modified a few bytes, so the entire file has changed. So I need to send it out across the entire file. Instead, ZFS actually knows exactly what blocks have changed through the different snapshots. So it can actually send just the delta. So it knows exactly which data blocks have changed, and that's all that gets sent across. So the last little bit is Dtrace. So Dtrace is a system for dynamic instrumentation of production systems. Dtrace was created by uh, Brian Cantrell, Adam Leventhal, and Mike Shapiro. It originally came out in 2003 for Solaris 10, and it was the first thing that Sun open sourced as part of Open Solaris in 2005. Currently, you can get Dtrace on SmartOS, Illumos, and all other Solaris Direct systems. And you also have it available on Mac OS X, FreeBSD, QNX. It's also a work in progress on a couple other systems. So there's two ports to Linux, one done by Oracle, one done by some other folks. There's a port to NetBSD right now. And even Sony is actually porting Dtrace for their console development. So, it's seen a lot of widespread development and a lot of use outside of just the original Solaris community. So Solaris it is, right. Dtrace is much more than kind of the equivalent of, people will think of Dtrace, oh, so clearly it must be like strace and Trust. And unlike strace and Trust, which look only at basically kind of the system call libraries, basically you, use, you run Trust on the process, you're going to see all the system calls it's making, you're going to get the return values, you're going to see the arguments, and the way that Trust does that is basically literally by going in, it's going to set breakpoints on processes. So basically, once you hit some function in libc, right before you make the system call, it's going to stop your process. Someone's going to have to go read data and kind of continue on. So this causes a lot of performance headache and just doesn't really scale very well. So instead of what Dtrace does is Dtrace basically allows you to kind of go and pick arbitrary points in the system and instrument those. So you can go, for example, look at every kernel function entry and return Point. You could actually take every process and break it down based on every actual instruction in the, in the user land process, which normally isn't that useful, but you can basically has a lot of flexibility. The other piece that you can do is you can define static points. So 
Static points are useful because you want to actually define something that makes semantic sense to you. So, for example, you want to define something based on what your MySQL database queries take. So you can actually know what they are, and that isn't going to be based on what the name of the function is in MySQL, where the query starts and the query ends. So that way, from release to release, everything doesn't break. Kind of the last little piece of dtrace that's really important is that it aggregates its data in the kernel. So what this means is that, say you want to dtrace something on every packet, the current, every packet that came in. That's causing, if you have something a uh, fast network connection, maybe you're getting a million events per second. So that, that's a lot of events. So instead of trying to do that and say, print out something or append to a log every single time that happens, which would just either A, require you to have a lot of memory, so you've got to keep around that much memory for a while, or B, drop events. You can basically do aggregations in the kernel, so you can basically look at aspects of it and understand it. And we'll look at an example of this. And kind of the, the, the important part of Detroit, as Brian would like to say, is that it was designed with safety from the beginning. So safety was a key component of this, because you have to feel comfortable running this on your production system. If you were going to run this on a production system and it crashed, your system, well, why would you ever run it again? Why would you trust it? So, we use this, it's basically, we have Dtrace running in production on systems 24-7. So we feel that it's safe to use, and it's kind of, that's been the design tenet from the get-go. So here's an example of what Dtrace actually is doing. So here we're looking at MySQL query latency. And I'm, I'll come to this side just because that's where I am, so apologies to those on the other side of the room. But what we're doing is we're actually saying, when does the query start? So when the query starts in MySQL, we're going to record the timestamp. Then, when the query, when we get the query basically being notified is done, we're going to then subtract that and basically calculate the delta. Then we're going to use that to basically aggregate that. We're going to use a quantize. So we're going to basically bucketize this based on powers of two. So we can say basically what bucket does this fall into? Is it from the two to four, four to eight? So we can use this to characterize and basically create an understanding of what our how our system is performing. So. Here, we basically have done this, and because we have nanos, basically, I'd say accurate to maybe 10 to 20 nanosecond granularity, we can actually go and see how our query is done. So as we can see some queries are taking about four microseconds, and the bulk of ours are coming into kind of the 12 millisecond, 20 millisecond, 50 millisecond, and they're kind of increasing. So this is kind of just the basic idea of what you can do with Dtrace. Then, what you can, the other kind of powerful thing is that right now we're just looking at this from MySQL's point of view. We can also then, in the same probe, go and say, okay, so what, how much time did we actually spend in the file system during here? We can do that in the exact same thing. So we can actually break down how long was MySQL spent in the total query, how long did it spend reading from disk or waiting for disk, and then how long did it spend just crunching time on CPU. So with all this, we kind of get to KVM. So why, why KVM? Why, you know, if we have all these things, like why do we bother, you know, Porting KVM. So uh, there's a lot of reasons. One, we need the ability to virtualize existing build app. A lot of us are stuck. We have Windows systems sometimes. Someone basically is mandated. We have AD set up. We have Exchange. And we curse it. But that's just the reality of life. We're kind of stuck with these. And while we'd like someone to change, that's not the case. The other thing is that we sometimes have systems which are basically set up and be such a, such a weird particular configuration that trying to reproduce this or get this going in on new hardware sometimes isn't worth it. You're not going to basically buy a new machine, which has the power of you know, your old rack, and basically use it for only one purpose. So you need to basically have some way of divvying it up. The other thing is that you want to have the flexibility to run other operating systems. You know, I'm, I like Lumos. I think it's great. You know, a lot of some people prefer Linux. They prefer BSD. They prefer Windows even. So you want to make sure they actually have the flexibility and they have the options to do what makes the most sense. 